Hello and welcome! In today's game, Stockfish outplays Leela in the Hedgehog. This is game 80 of the 14th Top Computer Chess Championship Super Final. And Stockfish starts with e4, Leela plays c5, knight f3, e6, d4, takes, takes, and a6. And uh, we have a Sicilian Khan variation on our board. With his last move, black wants to rule out any aggression with uh, something going to b5. Bishop d3, and now knight f6. Black is inviting white to clamp down on his central pawn with e5, so that he can win the pawn with queen a5 check. So white castles, making the idea actually viable, since there's no check anymore. So black plays queen c7, guarding e5, queen e2, renewing the threat, and d6, stopping it again. Now, the Sicilian defense was very popular until the 1900s. A lot of people were playing it successfully. They were getting in their liberating d5 breaks and were getting active pieces and great counterattacks. People were very happy with the results. And then, in around 1905, Maruzi Geza, a Hungarian grandmaster, advocated the move c4 for white with the idea to clamp down on the d5 square and make black's life a bit more miserable. And indeed, it's very hard for Danny Boy to advance when uh, two pawns are waiting for him to kick his ass. So what happened next is panic. More and more players were playing c4 and black didn't manage anymore to get in d5 successfully and was getting a cramped position and eventually was choked to death by white. And the situation escalated so much that for several decades it was considered a positional blunder for black to allow c4. Because of its debilitating effect on black, the system was named the Maruzi bind. After trying for about 50 years to come up with a solution to the bind, eventually people came up with an adequate system called the Hedgehog. And this system was used in today's game by Leela unfortunately for her unsuccessfully. Now let's see how this system works. The general plan for black in the hedgehog is to take up a very defensive but solid stance. Black puts most of his pawns on his third rank to control all the important squares on the fourth and develop all of his pieces behind the pawns. And then, once all the pieces are in position, just do nothing. You didn't expect that, didn't you? Actually, what I mean by that is to do nothing active. Black will be very, very patient, waiting for white to overextend, and then, when the right moment comes, he will counterattack. The game continued with g6, knight c3, bishop g7, the last book move, bishop e3, castles, rook d1, and knight d7. In the hedgehog, Black plays b6, bishop b7, and the knight goes to d7 to not block the bishop. Rook c1 and rook d8. <clears throat> now, I'm not quite 3500 Elio yet, so I don't dare judging their moves. What do I know? But practice in human games proved that this rook usually stays better on e8 rather than d8. I will explain why is that, but let's get first into the typical hedgehog position. b3, b6, f3, bishop b7, queen f2, rook c8, bishop f1, allowing the rook to see more, queen b6, getting off the c-file. This move in some cases can also defend b6 or even support b5. And this is now the typical setup for the hedgehog. Actually, the dark squared bishop sometimes is developed to e7 and then transferred via d8 to c7 from uh, where it looks dangerously towards the white king side. So, as we can see, black developed most of his pawns to the third rank from where they control most of the fourth rank, so it's impossible for white to jump in with some piece. These pawns are like the quills on the hedgehog, ready to poke anything that comes too close. White's idea is uh, to advance on the queen side and attack black's pawns, or to advance on the king side. 
Black's main counter-attacking ideas, when the right time comes, is to play d5 or b5, liberating his position. Right now, playing d5 or b5 would just simply lose a pawn without any benefit. Black usually waits until white weakens the c4 pawn with b4, and then he can play knight e5 and, together with the rook, put pressure on c4. Or white might advance the pawns of the king side, weakening e4 and the long diagonal, and then black can jump sometimes to c5 with the knight and, together with the bishop, attack e4. The most important thing for black is to do these breaks, d5 or b5, when his pieces can get active. And black does this sometimes even if it loses a pawn. Now, as I mentioned, this rook usually stays better on e8. And that is because once black hopefully gets in his d5 break, these pawns will get exchanged and the rook will get to attack some juicy stuff on the e file. There is usually at least a bishop there, but sometimes even the queen. Yummy! Now let's see what happened in the game. Knight a4, attacking b6. Bishop c6, attacking the aggressor. Black would love to take the knight and establish a strong knight on c5. But the bishop gets exchanged and I don't like giving up this bishop at all. If the position opens up later, after d5, this bishop could be very useful. The knight goes back, since there is not much else to do on a4. b6 is sufficiently guarded, and this also allows the pawns to advance. Knight d8, uncovering the bishop, defending d6. Knight d2, heading to d4, rook back, knight d4, queen b7, and rook c2. White is doubling on the d5, but it's hard to win d6 though. Rook c8, rook d2, bishop f8, and g4. Instead of going for a queenside attack, Stockfish now focuses on the kingside. Without black's light squared bishop, there's uh, far less danger in advancing the pawns. Knight g7, it's hard to come up with something active for black. Maybe d5 would still be an idea to activate the rooks, even if it loses a pawn. Queen e2, knight back h4, stockfish is going for it, knight f6, queen f2, threatening h5, g takes and g5, h5 stopping that, g5, knight back, queen e2, with a possible idea of putting the bishop on g3, attacking the pawn, knight c5, bishop f2, rook b8, preparing b5, queen e3, stopping b5, Rook back, bishop g3, great diagonal, bishop g7, bishop back, stockfish maybe doesn't like that diagonal so much, rook d8, bishop g3, they're both showing off their high level shuffling skills, rook back, knight c2, knight d7, and f4. Slowly, stockfish gains some space, and soon he'll break with e5. Lila thinks it's time to do something active, so b5, and now e5, opening up the like square bishop. Black can take because of bishop g2, and losing the knight either after queen b8 and rook takes, or after queen a7, queen exchange, and rook takes on d7. So instead of taking, Lila plays d5, but now the dark squared bishop is sad. And here Stockfish now gives up his knight for the two central black pawns. And a very excited light squared bishop because the diagonal is opening up. The rook takes the knight, pawn takes, attacking the knight multiple times. Lila decides to keep the rooks on for some counterplay. She moves the knight. And now rook d7 invades decisively. Knight takes, rook takes, queen c6. Notice how the bishops guard every square around the white king. Check, and Stockfish gets a shiny new queen. Lila takes the rook, and queen b4. Rook c1, and bishop e1, threatening to skewer the queen and rook. Queen checks, queen blocks, queen back, and queen c3. White is uh, setting up an attack on the black pawns, 
king back, bishop d3, queen c7, queen e4, threatening to take on h5. The game is over, but uh, Lila tries to prolong her suffering by giving up pieces. Rook takes bishop, queen takes, a5, queen back, check, king g2, a4, queen g6, king g8. And the game ends after queen d5, king f8, queen e6, threatening mate. And after rook c2, the game was ended. A great game by Stockfish, who equalized the score in the super final with 20 games to go. This shapes up to be an exciting finish. If you are new to my channel, then uh, please consider subscribing. And if you enjoyed this game, then check out these two also. Maybe you will find them interesting. Thanks for watching and see you soon.